And uh, yeah, so there's gold in them thar trees. Uh, this is a article in Scientific American, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read a couple of clips from it. Scientists in Australia focused on eucalyptus trees since traces of gold are sometimes found in soils surrounding these plants. However, researchers were not certain until now whether trees could ap ap bleh bleh, actually absorb the precious metal from underground deposits of the wind, uh, uh, or if the wind simply blew gold dust there from other sites. Now, I, I believe certainly that gold dust uh, or gold that's in the, the under, underground layers could be freed up by the root structures of the trees and, and sucked up into the tree. But one thing that they haven't talked about at all, which we're going to touch on today, is this concept of biological transmutation and the idea that maybe the trees themselves are producing the gold. And I think that there's a lot of evidence for that being the case, or at the very least, that when the, the titanic trees met their their end that there was a transmutation of elements that took place as a result of high power events whether they were electrical plasma high heat whatever it was and it may be that the, whatever the constitution of the tree was certain species of tree lend themselves better to the production of gold than others because i don't believe that they're all containing gold uh, and some are obviously going to contain more than others um, so they talk about, we were astounded at the capability of the eucalyptus trees to bring up gold from the equivalent height of a 10-story building. They're talking about the root structures going down. Uh, a geochemist at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia told Live Sciences, Our Amazing Planet. The researchers are not proposing mining these eucalyptus trees for gold, Lintern cautioned. The amount of gold in the trees is extremely small. You'd need 500 or more trees over a gold deposit to have enough gold to make a ring. So obviously that's not very much um, gold. So how did they determine that it was there? Well, they obviously grab the leaves. Apparently the gold works its way up into the, the leaves um, and, and can be found in trace amounts there. But we're going to find out that it's, it's actually more than that. Because uh, here they're saying that the trees could help miners identify where deeply buried gold deposits might be located and therefore avoid wasting time, money, and resources hunting for the precious metal over vast tracts of land. So another possibility would be the idea that the giant trees were making gold and then these smaller trees are the equivalent of moss by, by comparison on top of the, the the remains of those giant trees which are breaking down and so yeah the root structures might be freeing up some of the material that was in the great trees or they might be uh, producing the gold themselves and um, yeah let's see there's another so let me just uh, I, I did this in one of the recent streams but I'll I'll do it here very quickly we can just go through some of these. So gold is found in quartz veins, and the, at least the highest quantities of it. And so when they want to, to mine for gold, they're looking for quartz. And I'm of the mind, and I've got a video called Quartz is Sap, that quartz is the petrified sap of the great trees. And that's where they're finding gold. And I think that the gold was probably... Perhaps if, if the gold is being produced in the tree while it's living, then I think the gold is some part of the, the, um, the, 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 the nervous system of the tree. That's my theory. Uh, so this is, this is an example of what used to be all over the realm. And Ben, who was in the chat earlier, the archivist, he, he's um, found many articles talking about them harvesting these petrified trees because they were containing large percentages of gold, copper, silver, and other precious metals and gemstones. And so what we have left is, I don't know where this photograph was taken, but you've got the petrified forest and they talk about it as kind of an anomaly that 
you know, these trees that are said to be hundreds of millions of years old um, are, you know, petrified to stone. And I'm not going to go into the whole paraminalization, petrification subject today. I've done that in, um, in some of these recent live streams. But this is just examples of, of how gold is found in quartz. And quartz seems, if you know what you're looking at, appear very much to be the sap running through the great trees. And you can see when gold is actually, they, I, I think they've removed the quartz through some kind of a chemical process in this, in this uh, photograph. And you can see that it's just growing just like root structures of a tree or, or um, I think actually this might be silver because silver does the exact same thing. And um, yeah, so fascinating stuff. One of the biggest nuggets ever found there. And this is what they would have been mining for. And, uh, and other elements as well. Yeah, so there's gold in them, thar trees. And so here, I just want you to think about gigantic tree. And I uh, have to... Back in the bedrock that had a bunch of gold stuck in... Sorry, I'm going to mute it. I don't want to get a strike. So, so basically, okay, look at this. When you, when you see here, this to me is looking like the micro layering of tree rings. And look at where he's finding this gold. It's just embedded in those rings. And you get something like $500 worth of gold, you know, just because just he's there in the river bottom. It's just sitting there. Why is it just sitting there? I think that this is made by the trees. And as things erode and break up, it frees up some of this stuff. This is what the miners are doing intentionally, but it also happens naturally. And gold is so heavy, it just sits there at the bottom. So there's a potential uh, income source for for many of you. <laughs> All right, this is a cool video. So this gets back to this whole idea of the trees taking up gold and why that might be significant. So last name. <laughs> so so the reason I'm going live with Daniel is uh, a long time ago. I, and, and maybe I don't know if you guys know about this book or not, but it's called De Re Metallica. It was written in the 1500s, and it was a Spanish Bible on how they mine gold, how they process gold, how they find gold. And everybody's saying, how are the Spaniards able to go around and find all this, this gold? And, and people, hey, A.V. Adams, how you doing? Anyways, it's... Uh, they, they say, how are the Spaniards able to find all this gold? And then everybody says, well, they was out dowsing. Well, they did dowsing. They used the Spanish dip needles. Um, but but also, if you read that book, De Re Metallica, hey, hey, JC, JCL Ohio, how you doing? Oh, we got 12 people online. Anyways, back. Just to your credit, this is from a channel called Terry Carter. Back to De Re Metallica. I think he, he goes hunting for gold. Metallica, if, uh, if you read that book, they talk about one of the ways that they found the gold and silver was by reading the plants and the trees. The, the plants and the trees have a different cue to them uh, if they're growing over minerals. And, and Daniel uh, is a professional arborist and, and has learned this stuff, and there's not very many people in the country that know how to do this. So, so with that said, Daniel, I'm going to take it, give it to you, and, and tell us about how... You read the plants and trees and, and how that tells you that there's minerals there. Darren, how you doing? <laughs> well, it's actually really, uh, really fun and exciting. I love trees, always have, but they tell a story. They give you the, the story of what's happening under the ground. And, uh, you know, gold being toxic, these metals we're looking for, these are, these are toxic. You know, you eat enough gold, you're going to die. Same thing for the trees. They start eating up these, this gold through their roots, and then they start to get real sick. And so my job as a plant health care professional, as a certified arborist, uh, has always been to improve the health of these trees. 
And I focused on these patterns from these heavy metals because I saw a big opportunity there. A few other people have seen that as well, and you could read a lot of stories about people doing it in Australia and other places. So I'm not going to play a lot um, of this, but the the point is that this guy specializes in reading the trees, and he can tell where the gold is based on how the trees are growing. The idea is that that there's all kinds of ways to test for this in the leaves and in the um, and in in the root systems and and this guy is an expert in that and it's a it's a very interesting conversation looking at the roots of the tree it's broken down looking at the leaves when to look when to take photos like what time of year he's talking about mining mining camps pests in the trees uh google earth and this is going to get into a little story i'm going to tell here so um you know you can look at stuff on he can he can spot where gold is just looking on Google Earth because he can see that certain trees are going to, you know, they're going to have, like when the fall colors happen, they're going to have uh, much higher quantities of particular colors. That's a, that's an interesting um, little, little bit of information because uh, I had a friend when I went to college in Santa Barbara in California, he was my, my good buddy. Uh, we got, we got each other through math together. <laughs> and he he was studying geology and when he went on to do a master's in geology after that uh, i haven't talked to him in years i should reach out to him he would be blown away by this stuff uh, he worked on a project that was a research project that was really interesting they were they were trying to figure out how to get rid of plastic landmines you know in these these third world war-torn countries where they're using landmines that they've specifically made out of plastic so that you can't find them with medical metal detectors right they don't want they don't want the enemy going through the fields with metal metal detectors finding them disarming them and, and taking them out well that might be great for wartime but it's really bad for after wartime for small children who might be playing in those fields and then boom they they go and and it's it's so difficult and costly to remove these things and people lose their limbs and lose their lives in the process so the question was, how can we find these things in a, in a much easier way? And he was part of this project that was a genius idea that this guy got to genetically modify plants or through hybridization or I don't know how, how it worked, but to specifically design a plant that was incredibly hardy that would, would grow in the, the toughest of, of circumstances, so you know desert-like conditions, and and so then the idea was to to modify this plant so that it would respond to the the explosive in a particular way that would cause it to alter its coloring and so then the idea would be to to fly over these areas where the landmines were known to be and they would seed that area with a lot of this plant that grew who knows something like kudzu or something that just grows and grows rapidly and and they would they would seed it and then these plants would grow and as they grew they would they would be genetically altered by the proximity to the explosives which is really cool because then what they could do is fly over in airplanes with um and and they could photograph with broad spectrum cameras and they would be able to spot where the landmines were based on the growth patterns of these plants so that was a project that my that my my friend worked on and apparently it it functioned whether they're actually using that technology now as a way of removing these things i don't know they seem to be more interested in dropping bombs and placing more landmines than getting rid of them but um that's you know because we live in a world that's run by the industrial military industrial complex which is a sad state of affairs so that's an interesting video check that out just to me more potential confirmation of of this idea that the trees might be actually producing gold and uh, and that if you know what to look for, you know where to find it. So that also speaks to the the idea of a vested interest in keeping this secret, because then who's going to who's going to profit from all of this being secret? The people who know who own the mining companies who know that maybe some of these mountains were once titans and they have very, very special tissues that if you know where to look you'll find 
rare gemstones or rare elements or whatever, or or trees or or, or you know, you name it. Um, so I think that um, if they know the truth about that, then then they're not going to be eager to share it with the rest of the world. And they're making mention in this video of a of a document which you can find for free online, and it's already been translated into English, called De Re Metallica. It's a Spanish document from the 1500s. This is going back a long time. And this is talking about all of the different technologies that they had, the, the pumping systems. Uh, it's, it's just, I, I, haven't even, I haven't even begun to dip into this. Um, but if you go go back to the just to the index uh, of of the let's see here you know you can see like there this is heavily referenced this is from Pliny the elder one of the uh, the Greek you know writers and it's like all of these different these different aspects just written about by Pliny and uh, over here uh, there was somebody else I uh, a name that I saw that was pretty well-known Magellan, I think, was on there, and you know, this is this is just the the index for this book, six hundred pages long. Um, and at, at some point, I may sit down and actually try and go through that, but this is not that point. De Re Metallica. It's found on archive.org for free, and um, that's just an example of something that probably most people going through um uh you know geology school to become geologists have probably never heard of that and don't know anything about it just like the cardiologists don't know anything about the myocardioventricular band the schools are hopelessly behind in the times and you know probably intentionally so if you know much about our history this was really interesting this came in uh, a week or two ago on my video called quartz of sap this guy writes, at the Colorado School of Mines, a very good school, we learned that uh, we learned things that were incredible for the location of gold veins, quartz, other precious metals. So gold in a vein, right? Hold on a second. Plasma lightning strike can instantly create metals. Also, any organic property subjected to high plasma lightning or something like scalar will cause great effects gold veins are plasma going through biological matter coupled with massive pressure waves and shocking winds winds that cause shock waves make pressure as the plasma provides electrical current and you get veins of metals we had a teacher who mentioned carefully uh let's see did i get these in the wrong order Ah, who mentioned carefully, if you see mountains or hills that appear like a huge human or some creature, that we should check certain areas around it for metals. It works. I'm sitting in the desert now where quartz is everywhere, and copper mines, on, uh, and, and there's a copper mine on the other side of the mountain. Just picked up a piece of, piece of quartz that caused my GP7000 gold meter to go off. Was set to locate larger gold, not small. This sample is in front of me. The hillside had areas that resemble an odd creature and has caves going over 600 to 1500 feet. Old gold mines everywhere. Last week, the owner was offered $1.5 million to sell the land. The buyers want every home gone as part of the deal. Imagine that. So yes, our race is much smaller to keep pace with its resource, recourses or resources. I'm not sure which, which he meant there. Uh, um, think about it. The smaller you are, the less you'll consume. So here we are as grasshoppers compared to our past history. The entire known landmass is a mining colony, a wasteland. You can see huge trails called mountains or volcanoes, valleys like Grand National, our old ditches, and so on. Was home to giants compared to us. 
It's not that they're huge. It's that we are very, very small. And that's the story. The truth is being uncovered daily. People with eyes to see are understanding. Mainstream and current educational systems are to confuse you. So it's about time to wake up. I know of only a few others. I, I, have, I know of only a few others that understand. Um, wait a minute. I see, okay. I know of only a few others that understand. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I was looking at the wrong part. I know of only a few others that understand. One gave this video to me. Thanks. He's referring to my video there. Yeah, so I've had several, several people from the mining industry reach out to me, especially when it comes to the big tree stuff, and tell me that it's absolutely spot on. And some have said that people in the, the higher ups know about this stuff. And this uh, was on my recent video called Point and Claim or Look and See. What do you think? And um, some are just saying, oh, it's just rocks. And, and there's no evidence to support this big tree thing. You're just pointing and claiming because it looks like something. And I would say that's ignorant. There's a shit ton of evidence in favor of this, whether it's historical, whether it's from old newspaper articles, whether it's from the mining industry, whether it's from actual HD quality boots on the ground footage showing every single aspect of the big trees. There's tons of evidence. So it's anything but point and claim. It's point and see. And as this person agreed, Anyone that can't see that was wood is either knowingly part of the cover-up or is lost beyond saving. This is just looking at the idea that there are these ancient, uh, that there are these, these cavernous cave structures that have been discussed under, like, entire continents seem to have had these things. This is South Africa. Oh, that reminds me of a story I wanted to tell. So I went to South Africa for in 2007 for the um, for the World Congress of Chiropractic Students. I was a delegate representing my school there, and the guy who hosted the conference was a student. Uh, he he was he was the one arranging our our conference, and there was one point where the the some of the delegates were invited home to this guy's house, his parents' house. And this was in Johannesburg, South Africa. What a place. Wow. It felt like apartheid was still there. The hotel we stayed in, all of the managers were all white and the entire staff were all black. And um, they were all like really timid and yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, and they do anything you asked instantly. You know, it was really felt like I'd gone kind of back into the days of slavery and it was not a safe place. There was a, there were some of the places we drove through were, were nuts. Like you would not have wanted your car to break down, uh, <laughs> at nighttime in these areas. And we would drive from basically gated compound to gated compound. And, and, um, it was, a, I, I was there for a week. It was, it was unusual. I remember flying in when, when I, we came into land to, in the airport, there uh, from the air i saw oh there's johannesburg and then as we got closer i was like what is that it looked like a it looked like a giant dump on the side of the city and johannesburg is a big city i think there's over a million people there and um and as we flew in and we got closer i realized that what i thought was a dump was a shanty town that was just it was it was like a million people in this shanty town and this was back during uh, the ethnic cleansing that Mugabe was supposedly doing, uh, the Zimbabwe re refugees were, were pouring in to Johannesburg at something like 50,000 refugees a day for a period of time. And they had nowhere to go but this shantytown. I have no idea how these people survive and where they get their running water from. And uh, it was just, I, I can't even imagine it. Um, but the reason I brought that up is that the, at this dinner, when we went to, to this home, the father of the guy who was organizing the conference, he was a specialist in mining. And some of the deepest 
mines in the world are in South Africa. That's where most of the diamonds come from. I guess like the De Beers control that, you know, it's all, it's all Dutch. It goes back to the Dutch East Indy trading company. And, you know, they cornered the, the market on gold and diamonds and a lot of it comes from that part of the world. So when I see this, when I see this map here, I'm just like, what were they digging down into? You know, well, this guy told this story of the, the mining shafts. And he told us that these things go miles down and you get in these elevators, it just goes miles and miles down. And the, the, he, he talked about the monstrosity, the size of these things. And, I, you know, I didn't know about any of this stuff I've been talking about today back then, obviously. Um, so it never occurred to me to ask any, you know, more pointed questions. But I was really struck by the way he was describing this. And, and he kind of he sto he spoke about it like with an air of mystery and i if i remember correctly he even talked about how some of the stuff seemed like it had already been there for a really really long time um and i mean how could that be with 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 mines that are going down miles like what technology did they have even a hundred years ago that could pull off something like that uh let alone hundreds of years ago so that's why i brought that up and you can see here, this is India, I guess, and, and that would be Madagascar. And, uh, I mean, the maps, how different they looked um, back then, you know, water levels and everything. So this looks like the water levels are higher. India would have been a lot bigger. And there's another one of those giant, giant uh, caverns, whatever those were. It's like Journey to the Center of the Earth.